Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, uh, many people here don't know me well, so I will first introduce myself. I am not from the distributed uh, machine learning or optimization area. I'm a bit from outside, but I know that some people here are interested in what, what I will talk about, and I'm also interested in knowing more about the area. So this is my wordle. I mean, so words are bigger if they appear more in the titles of my of uh, my uh, papers. So you can see that mostly in my career I worked on constraint reasoning and then I worked also a lot on preferences, on uh, uh, soft constraints, multi-agent systems. So this is what in the recent years I've been working on and this is also the main topic of the talk today. Uh, earlier, uh, early I worked on logic programming, graph commerce, semantics, concordancy, these other things, but then I switched to this uh, main topic, which is constraints and preferences. So, in this talk, I will uh, focus on preferences, and in particular, the use of preferences in the context of making a collective decision in a multi-agent system. And so the, the, I will focus mainly on three things. So first, how to model the preferences of these individual agents, because uh, when you have a lot of things to express your preferences on, then you have an issue on how to model these preferences compactly. Then how to reason with these preferences, because you need to answer queries about your preferences. Uh, and then how to aggregate them to finally get this uh, collective decision. Okay? And then uh, at the end of the talk, I will give you two concrete examples in the, because the scenario is, the set of scenarios is very big, the two concrete examples of which I'm working on recently, which is uh, sentiment analysis and stable matching. So um, how does it relate? How do, the, the, how do I think it relates to the topic, the main topic, the core topic of this workshop? Is that, uh, well, usually preference aggregation has been always seen as a centralized uh, uh, task. So individual agents express their preferences, they give it to somebody, and this somebody, system, a person, a chair, collects all these uh, preferences and does some reasoning and uh, generates uh, the collective decision. Okay? So uh, uh, I think that in order to make a big step forward, we need to uh, avoid uh, as much as possible this centralization step and to see whether it's possible to do that in a distributed way. Um, also, um, in, in this uh, setting uh, that I will consider, you will see while we go through that there are several uh, optimization and machine learning tasks uh, to be addressed. And so it would be nice uh, for people in this crowd to understand how to distribute and parallelize this task to be able to scale. So preferences have been the subject of my research for many years now, and I think they are, uh, they are very important concepts because they appear in many, many things that we do in our everyday life. Okay? So uh, usually we have preferences about all things that we do, like I prefer Venice to Rome. This is, you know, I come from Italy, so I live very close to Venice, and I actually do prefer Venice to Rome. And, um, and previously, I was working on constraint reasoning. Constraints are, like, in my view, a less tolerant uh, form of preferences. Uh, constraints are very strict. They tell you what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. While preferences, that, uh, they allow you to give a graded level of acceptance. Okay? So they're more, more fle flexible, in my view. Uh, and if you insist in representing all your thoughts and uh, opinions in terms of constraints, uh, which are not so flexible, then possibly you will end up with no solution to your scenario that you have in your mind. Or if you have many solutions, then you don't have any way to discriminate among them. So because if you have many things that are acceptable, then how do you know which one you prefer and which one you're not? So Preferences are really a very important concept in my view. And in general, when people talk about preferences, a prefer expressing a preference over some items, it just means giving an ordering over the items. When I say an ordering, it doesn't mean that it has to be a total, a linear order. It could have incomparability, it could have missing things, but it is an ordering, just an ordering over things. Like I prefer apples to oranges to bananas. And this is a, a special case of a linear order, but in general, it doesn't have to be a linear order. 
Uh, the only thing is that uh, you can have incomparability, but I will assume rationality of the agents. That's what people, the, the terminology that people use, meaning that you have at least a transitivity property. You know, you're not going into cycles in your preferences. Uh, so many problems are naturally modeled with preferences and with constraints. Like in uh, configuration, timetabling, uh, these are typical scenarios where you have, where you want to have, uh, be able to be able to express both preferences and actual strict constraints. So we need to be able to represent of both of them. Um, so the setting that I will consider is this one. So you have several agents, people, uh, systems, uh, software agents, whatever, several agents, I will call them agents in general, and uh, um, there is a, a set of possible decisions that they're going to take. And this set is known to everybody, so it's common to all the agents, and then each agent is going to provide preferences over these possible decisions. And now, based on these preferences of the agents, you have to choose one of the decisions, which is going to be called the collective decision. A decision that satisfies as much as possible the preferences of these agents. Okay? This is just actually one of the possibilities to choose one of the decisions, but you could also choose a set of decisions, like when you are deciding on a committee of people, then everybody has his own preferences, and then you have to choose a set of people, not just one. Or um, you could also decide that you want as an output not one or a set of decisions, but a ranking of overall decisions. The top choice, the second choice, the first choice, third choice, and so on. Okay? So, but I will focus on this, which is the simplest case, and then the other ones also are being treated in the literature, of course. Let's give a very simple and very toy example. So there are some friends that want to have uh, dinner together, want to cook dinner together, and uh, they want to eat the same thing, so the same menu. Uh, so being from Italy, you know that I, we have this uh, uh, set of things that we usually eat. There is a pasta dish, there is a main dish, a dessert, and then something to drink. Okay? So then they have one uh, um, value for each one of these variables, let's say. One of, each one of them is a decision variable. You need to decide on the pasta dish, a main dish, a dessert, and a drink. And each friend has his own preferences over all possible meals that are combination of four values for these four variables. You know, you have, a, let's say, for example, you have five options for pasta dish, five options for main dish, five desserts, and five possible drinks. Well, you have a lot of different menus, but each friend has his own preferences over these possible menus, and you have to choose one which satisfies more or less all these preferences. So in this case, the agents are the friends. Uh, the combination of values of these four variables are the candidate decisions or possible uh, menus. Okay? So uh, some more, uh, um, some more uh, realistic application domains, uh, well, uh, where you would like to have uh, the possibility to aggregate uh, preferences. Uh, for example, you may have a committees of solvers, like in constraint solving, you give your uh, constraint problem in, um, to several constraint solvers, and then they tell you what they think is the best, or the second, or the, third, the first solutions, and then you aggregate this to get a result, or as committees of classifiers, like in machine learning, people have been using that, or a committees of sensors that maybe give their own opinion in terms of sensor, in terms of data that you receive from the sensor, on some item, and then you need to aggregate them to get a more accurate opinion. Or configurator, I know like people, I was in a table with a, with a student who was working on recommender system based on ranking um, systems or recommender reputation system. Uh, assistive technology is also another area where you want to uh, provide the care for elderly people based, uh, for example, you want to schedule the daily activities and this schedule has to be compliant and also to satisfy as much as possible the preferences of a number of people, the doctor, the patient, the nurses, the, 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 pair, the, the, the family, and so on. And so you want to have the preferences of all and then to get a decision on the schedule. Um, in the book. Democracy, like when a city council wants to make decisions for the collectivity about whether to build a new uh, tennis court or a new pool for the community, well, these are community decisions, and you may want to get some uh, preferences from the individuals in the community before you take the decision. Uh, personalized assistance and social tools, like in Doodle, Doodle is a very simple case of a preference aggregation. <laughs> Each person is asked to, each person is asked to provide uh, um, acceptability or preferences in a very uh, simple 
inform about the possible times for the meetings, and then the chair decides based on these preferences. Okay? Uh, these two I put it last because these are the two examples I'm going to give. So in sentiment analysis, also you have a form of preference aggregation, very basic one, but you get the extract from some text, the preferences and the opinions of the individuals, and then you aggregate them in order to state what is the collective opinion. Okay? And the last one is table matching, and that I will describe later, where you have to find the matching between agents of two sides that respect some properties and the preferences of each of the agents. Um, so the first thing that uh, people do nowadays to um, to understand how to aggregate these preferences is to resort to this very classical and with a lot of literature uh, um, um, area, which is voting theory. Okay? Voting theory comes from uh, economics, uh, political science, uh, and uh, it deals with actual people with real elections, with candidates that are people, so not really our scenarios. But uh, it can also be uh, used in the scenarios that we consider that I uh, described before. So in voting theory, the agents are not called agents, of course. They're called voters. They are actual voters. And the possible decisions are not called possible decisions, but they're called candidates. Okay? They're the candidates that stand for the elections. And then, but the setting is not that different, uh, even though the terminology is different, because you have each voter which expresses his preferences over the candidates. In classical voting theory, usually these preferences are a linear order, you know, and they are expressed explicitly as a linear order. Okay? Because the number of candidates usually is not very large, so each person can say what is the top choice, second choice, and third choice explicitly without needing any compact uh, representation formalism. And then you choose, we will choose one candidate based on the voter preferences. Okay? And again, here you have these other two possible tasks, which is not just choosing one candidate, but a set or a ranking of all candidates. So you see the setting is not that different, but... Uh, um, it has a different terminology. But we will see later, actually, that in our scenarios, that there, are, there are other concerns that they don't consider at all. Like one of those that I told you already is the need for compact preference representation formalism that they definitely don't have. Okay? So in social choice or voting theory, um, um, the core lines of work, okay, the literature is huge, but I will just tell you what people now in AI are most interested in, multi-agent systems are most interested in out of voting theory, is this one. Okay, there have been many, many voting rules. A voting, rules is, a voting rule is just a mechanism, an algorithm, a function that takes the preferences of the individual agents and returns the result, the winning candidate. So there are many, many different ways to do that, many different voting rules. And uh, so what people did and are doing right now in voting theory is to define more and more ways to aggregate these preferences. Okay? And since there are so many of these ways, then they started uh, trying to understand which one is better, which one is worse, according to some criteria. And the criteria that they found are many, uh, uh, like they call them axiomatic properties of these voting rules, desirable properties. And then we'll say, okay, one uh, uh, voting rule is better than another one if it has more of these desirable properties. Okay? And we will see some results about that. And unfortunately, some very, very famous results in voting theory are impossibility results. So negative results that say that, uh, well, if you like these three desirable properties, for example, I'm sorry, there is no voting rule that can have these three desirable rules. So we'll see them. OK, so let's see some voting rules. The simplest one is called plurality. Plurality means that each voter just gives the top choice, one candidate only. Okay? And then the winning candidate is the candidate that has appears the largest number of time as the top choice of the, 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 the individual agents. So here, for example, see, there's an example of plurality voting. You vote just for one. You cannot say, this is my top choice, but I also like the other one. You can just vote for one. Okay? And then the winner will be the person here, which appears, most, which appears the largest number of times as the top choice of somebody. Okay? So plurality. Of course, plurality, when you uh, restrict yourself to two candidates only, it becomes uh, what is called the majority role. 
Okay? So the candidate that wins is the one that has the majority of the votes. Okay? So plurality and majority are very simple. Another one which is used a lot is called borda or borda count. And borda it requires actually the whole, from, from the individual agents, it requires a, a ranking over all the candidates. You have to say which is your first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, and fifth choice in this case. And then, and then uh, Borda will give, uh, will give a score for each candidate, and the score will depend on where the candidate is in this ranking of the individual. So it will give 0 point, 1 point, 2 points, 3 points, up to m minus 1 points if you have m candidates. And then you sum up all the scores that each candidate receives from all the individuals, and then the one with the highest score will be the winner. Okay? So Borda. Approval, approval is also uh, easy to use and to understand. Approval, it says, well, just tell me a set of candidates that you would like to win, the approved ones for you, uh, between 1 and n minus 1, if you have m candidates. And then you give one point to each one that has, that has been approved by you. And then again, I sum all these scores, and then the one with the highest scores win. Of course, all these uh, scoring rules, they're called, uh, they could have a tie. They could have several candidates that have the highest number, of, the highest score. And so you need some way to, to break the ties, some additional way besides what I told you here to break the ties, to get the result, which is just one winner. Uh, let's look at, uh, well, Copeland and Kappa are very different. They are based on pairwise comparison of the candidates. Like Copeland, for example, says, uh, I want to get, uh, uh, for each individual, the ranking over all the candidates. And then, uh, based on those rankings, uh, I will decide for every pair of candidates, let's say A and B, I will decide who is the winning candidate between these two. Because I will look at all the agents, and I will see what the majority tells me. Okay? If the majority tells me that A is better than B, then A wins over B. Okay? And then I do that for every pair of candidates. And then I will, uh, uh, the Copeland will uh, select the candidate which wins most pairwise comparisons, okay? with tie breaking if possible. Uh, let's keep cap. Let's take the last one, which is very used in practice in many uh, countries. This is called STV, single transferable vote. Again, you take the ranking of all the candidates from every individual. And then you do this. It says, if there is a candidate which has a major, look just at the top choices. If there is a candidate which has the majority of top choices, this is the winner. Okay. If there is no candidate which has the majority of top choices, then STV will eliminate the weakest candidate, meaning the candidate that has the least number of top choices. Okay. And then you start again without this candidate in the, in the preferences. Okay. You start again with the data that you had before, and you don't re-vote. And so you start again, say, you ask again if there is a candidate now that has the majority of top choices. And it's called a single transferable vote because in some sense you're transferring votes from one candidate to another. Because you, if, when you remove the weakest candidate, suppose this weakest candidate for some individual isn't the top choice, but is not the top choice of anybody else, so it's the weakest. So when you remove it, then the other candidates in some sense scale up. Okay? So you are transferring the votes of these candidates, which, was, which you just eliminated, to the second, the second one. Okay? So that's why it has this name. Okay? Uh, and you repeat until there is a major, somebody who has the majority of top choices. And at some point you will get to the point, because at some point you will have just two candidates, so somebody will have the majority, if you have an odd number of voters. Okay? So let's give an example. So plurality, as I said, these are just uh, agents. So they vote with just the top choice. They give you the top choice. These are the candidates. This is the top choice for the first voter, second vote, third, and so on. And the winner is this one because it has three top choices. This is two, this is one. Okay? No tie breaking here. I wanted to make it simple. Then you look at Borda. In Borda, each voter has to give the whole ranking of the candidates, top choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice. Okay? And then the winner is uh, computed by giving to each candidate a score, which depends on the position where he is. For example, this guy here, he gets zero, zero score here. He gets a uh, score of three from here. Again, score of zero here, score of two here, score of three here. So all together, he gets, uh, well, these are the scores. And so now you sum up all the scores for each candidate, and this is the winner because it gets a score which is higher than everybody else. So this is board account. Okay? Um, 
The last one that the we saw, it was STV, which is a bit more complicated than the other one because it has this kind of sequential behavior. And STV, as I said, suppose that, uh, so you have these voters, three voters vote like this, three voters vote like this, and so on. And then in STV you say, look at the first choices here, this first row. Is there anybody that has a majority of votes? No, because the majority would be, well, I don't know, but definitely more than, uh, more than four. So then um, you will eliminate the weakest candidate. And the weakest candidate is this guy. Because if you, uh, it has only one choice, suppose that uh, there is a tie-breaking, because also this one would be the weakest. But anyway, suppose you choose that one. So you eliminate that candidate. So that candidate now is eliminated. And so now the votes, for example, for this candidate get transferred. So this is the top choice now for this guy. So now you look again at the top choices, so these together with that. And you see if there is somebody who has the majority of votes, no. So you eliminate another weakest candidate, which in this case is this one, because this is uh, 3 plus 1, this one is 3 plus 1, and this one only two top choices. So you eliminate this one. And again, now you look at the top choices, which are these three, these, and that. Okay? So now uh, the winner is this one, because he has 3 plus 1 plus 2, and the other one is not. But now you knew that you had to stop, because you have... Uh, uh, oh, this is, I don't know, just remain there. Anyway, so I have to stop because you are just two candidates, so there must be a majority. Must be a majority. Okay, so now we saw just a page, at least, uh, I just put uh, enough voting rules to fill a page, but you can imagine that there are many, many different other ways to put together the preferences and to get a winner. Okay, so as I told you before, the voting theory people, they uh, started looking at properties of these voting rules uh, to try to put a structure into this big set of voting rules. And so they say, okay, what are some desirable properties that I would like to have? So first one, for example, is uh, called the Condorcet consistency. And it says, if there is a candidate who beats every other candidate in pairwise competitions, then this should be the winner. Okay? It cannot be that another one is the winner. So this is a very desirable property. You would not like a voting rule where every agent agrees that A is better than B, and then C is the winner. Okay? So anonymity and neutrality have to do just with the fact that you would like the result to be independent on the order of the candidates and the names of the agents. Okay? These are very reasonable, desirable properties. Monotonicity is something that also you would like to have because you say take, take a set of preferences and the current winner. And suppose somebody changes his mind and moves up to candidate A. Okay? Now, if um, A was the winner and you move up the candidate A, then A should still be the winner. It cannot be that by moving up A, which was already the winner, somebody else now is the winner. Okay? So this is monotonicity. Uh, consistency and participation, it just, participation just means that it's uh, um, uh, given any agent, any voter, the fact that he votes, so it's addition to a profile, a profile is just a set of preferences, uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot, be, cannot result in a loss for him. So if he votes, he must have the chance to get a result which is better according to his preferences. So his incentive to participation in some sense. Uh, the last one also is very desirable. It's called efficiency in voting theory. In our uh, terminology, it's called unanimity, because efficiency in computer science is a diff different thing. But anyway, it's unanimity. Unanimity says, if everybody <coughs> agrees that the top choice is A, then A should be the winner. It is very obvious that you would like to have. And then others. Okay? Uh, some other three, because these are very important for the results that I'll show you later. The first one is non-dictatorship. So it means, uh, let's look at the dual one. A voting rule is called a dictatorship when no matter how the agents give the preferences, the result is always what one of the agents says. So there is a dictator. Maybe you don't know who the, of the agent, but uh, there is always a dictator. Okay? So you would like your voting rule to not be a dictatorship, of course. Um, which seems like a very obvious thing to say and something that you definitely want to have, but you will see that in the possibility results, then it gets uh, into play. Uh, another one is independence with relevant interests. This is the most questionable property, whether it's really desired or not, uh, but it's interesting property. It says, uh, um, um, okay, so if you have a, a candidate X, which wins given some preferences, then, 
uh, then look at the relationship between X and another candidate, Y, okay, in the collective decision. Then this cannot depend on the relationship between X and somebody else, irrelevant alternative, into the independent, in the, in the, in the individual profiles. Okay? So in some sense, the relationship between X and Y, whether X is above or is preferred to Y or not, in the collective decision, should not depend on the preferences between X and Z and somebody else. Should only be to depend on the relationship between X and Y in the individual preferences of the agents. Okay? So this is obviously something that sounds reasonable, to me at least, but not many voting rules have it. And in fact, people, some people would say that it's not really as desirable as other properties. For, for, sure, for sure, it's not as desirable as this one. The last one is also very important because it's, understanding this has also spawned a very large body of literature in voting theory and also in the now multi-agent systems. So, um, a voting rule is called to be manipulable if uh, agents have the chance to get a better collective result according to their preferences by submitting false preferences. So let's give an example here. Suppose that you're using plurality, okay? So uh, these are all your agents. 49% of the agents vote like this. 20% vote like this, 20% like this, 11% like this. So according to plurality, plurality only looks at the top choices. Okay? According to plurality, this is the winner, because these are 49 votes out of uh, 100. This one is only 20, uh, 40, okay? and this one is only 11. So according to plurality, this is the winner. But look at these 11% of guys here. Okay? They got, uh, as collective decision, the worst possible result for them, this fair choice for them. Okay? But they understand that if they're going to submit not this preference ordering, but a different preference ordering where they switch these two by saying that this is the best choice for them while actually it's not the best choice for them, then in this new profile, this would be the winner. So they would get a better result for them, something which is preferred to this one, by submitting false preferences. So these agents have manipulated the result. Okay? So it means that plurality is manipulable. Okay? Manipulable, again, it means that some agents, in this case a set of agents, but even one sometimes, some agents can uh, get a better result by submitting false, false uh, preferences. Okay? So uh, a, a voting rule is called strategy proof if it's not manipulable. Ah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, well, well, we'll see that actually, you know, it's always the case, okay? So let's look at, uh, for example, for the voting rules that I wrote in my very incomplete <laughs> list, of course, every voting rule has a different set of these desirable preferences. For example, all the voting rules that I wrote are anonymous and neutral and non-dictatorial, and all of them are manipulable. Okay? I just showed you plurality, but I could show you examples of manipulability also in the other voting rules. Uh, all of them are efficient. Efficient means uh, unanimity, right? Uh, remember? All but uh, CAP. CAP, we didn't look into details. Uh, CAP and Copland are Condorcet consistent, but not the other ones. Uh, and everybody except CAP and Copland are consistent and participative. Okay? And independent to a relevant assumption, only one of them was uh, this property, approval. Okay? So this is just to say that uh, these are all desirable properties, but every voting rule uh, satisfies only some of them. Okay? So the question now that people have been uh, studying a lot is that is there a best voting rule? A voting rule that satisfies as most properties as is possible to satisfy. And the answer, the definite answer, exists only for very special cases, which is two options, two candidates. For two options, it is just majority. Okay? For two options, you just look what the majority of people say. Majority would say that A is better than B, or that B is better than A, and then this is the winner. If A is better than B for the majority, then A is the winner. Otherwise, that one. And May's theorem in 1952 is the one that states that majority rule for two options has all the possible desired property that you may want. Okay? But when you have three or more candidates, then unfortunately you have this very uh, strong impossibility result, Arrow's theorem. The Gotham is Nobel Prize in Economics in 72. So Arrow's theorem says 
if you have at least three candidates and at least two voters, of course you want to aggregate, so at least you have to have two voters, then it is impossible to have unanimity, independence to have totalities and non dictatoriality. Okay? So unfortunately, you know, maybe you can have other problems, but if you want to have these three, and three is a very small number, unanimity certainly you want to have, you remember, if everybody agrees that A is the top choice, then A should be the winner. Okay? You don't want to get rid of unanimity. You don't want to have a dictatoriality, okay? and independence of relative assumption is something questionable. So actually this result, some people say that is not so bad. Uh, so what uh, this result tells you, because, uh, okay, you don't want to give up this one or this one, but in the pen to relative assumption, maybe you want to, you, you're happy to use rules that don't have this property, okay? Another very important impossibility result that people have studied and uh, considered a lot is this other one, Gibbard and Satterwhite, because it was done independently by these two people, and this one is much, much worse than the other one. And this one says, it is impossible to have uh, these three properties together. And the three properties are, the first one is subjectivity. Subjectivity just means that the voting rule, voting rule, you remember, is just a function from a profile to a, a winning candidate. So being subjective, it means that everybody can be a winner. So everybody can win. So of course, you don't want to use candidates that cannot win. So you want your voting rule to be subjective function. So you don't want to get rid of this one. You don't want to get rid of non dictatoriality You don't want a dictatorship. And this, the third one is just uh, no manipulability. Okay? So basically it says, if uh, you use reasonable voting rules, reasonable means that everybody can win, then either it is a dictatorship or it is manipulable. Okay? Since you don't want a dictatorship, it just means that every reasonable voting rule is manipulable. Okay? So, and this is something very bad. You cannot get around this. Every voting rule is manipulable, like plurality that we saw before. So, um, um, this, this is where voting theory uh, stopped. I mean, stopped. This is where voting theory cons considered this result. Uh, in multi agent systems, uh, then other concerns came in and allowed actually to get around a little bit of this result, and we will see how. Yes? Yes, there, there are also non-deterministic ones. These, these, res, these um, are for deterministic ones. These impossibility results are for deterministic ones, yes. Um, okay, so um, there are many other, these are the core lines uh, that people have been studying in voting theory, but actually there are many other lines that I don't have time to talk about. One is judgment aggregation, which is a framework which is very similar to preference uh, aggregation, but uh, the agents are not uh, submitting preferences over some candidates, but are submitting their opinions, uh, judgments over s the truth value of some variables. And then you, the result is just the value of these variables, okay, according to the judgment of several judges. So it's a slightly different framework because among these variables that these judges have to judge, then you have some underlying theory that relates these variables, so one to the other one. And it has also many practical applications. Uh, okay, fair division, combinatorial auction, and stable matching are all other different variants of preference aggregation, which are not exactly fitting in the framework that I told you, but are very related. So if you want to know more, this is a very good book by Arro Sen Suru, Suzuru Mura that tells you everything you ever want to know about voting theory. Okay, okay so now, uh, as I said before, it looks like voting theory provides everything we need in our setting to do preference aggregation among agents, uh, because after all, you just change the terminology a little bit, but the setting is soon looks very similar. Instead of voters, you have agents. Instead of candidates, you have decisions. The preferences are still the preferences, and the winner is the decision whether they want to choose. But actually, it's not exactly like that, because there are many differences uh, that pose also many challenges. The first, the first thing is that in multi-agent scenarios, you can have a very large set of candidates, which in, in classical uh, people elections, you usually don't have. And since, as I told you before, you have this large set of candidates with uh, usually a combinatorial structure, you have the 
to answer this question, how can I model compactly these preferences over this large set of countries? I cannot uh, force every agent to list explicitly in a linear order all these candidates, because there are many. Like in the dinner example already, there were many dinners. You cannot force the friends to list all the possible dinners. Okay? Uh, second thing is that uh, usually in uh, multi-agent systems in the setting that we are considering, uh, not everybody wants to give preferences over all the candidates. But then, so there may be missing preferences for many reasons, because maybe it's costly to compute some preferences over some candidates, or maybe because there are privacy concerns, you don't want to share your preferences over some candidates to, with, uh, with the other agents or with the chair. So the, you may have incomplete preferences, and also not just linearly ordered, but you can have incomparable candidates. Okay? So, and so it, these are things that usually voting theory people didn't consider, and now we need to face. Uh, the other thing is that we have a computational concerns. We want the things that we want to do, we want to do them fast. The things that don't, we don't want to happen, we want to make them hard. Okay? And this also you know, uh, has to do with a very big line of work in uh, this area which uh, is multi-agent systems. And the last one is also not only in some scenarios you can have a large set of candidates and you have to deal with that, but also in other scenarios you have a large set of voters. Like when you extract preferences from blogs, from tweets, from uh, text, that uh, you have many, many people writing this text. So these are the voters. These are the judges that, that uh, express your preferences. So you have to deal with this massive amount of voters in some way. OK. So the computational social choice is this area, which is a very fast growing area in uh, AI and multi-agent systems. It's the fastest growing area in recent years. So if you look at the Proceedings of the large AI conferences, you will see that 10 years ago there was nothing about this in these proceedings. Now it's a very, very big area with many, many sub areas inside, always present in these big conferences. And it merges voting theory, game theory, which I didn't talk, we didn't get into the game theory, knowledge representation, constraint optimization, computational complexity, merges all of this to be able to address these issues and challenges for um, preference aggregation in multi agent systems. Okay, so let's look at each one of the challenges at the time. So the first one is a large set of candidates. So say, why do we have a large set of candidates? Because usually for us, is a candidate is a, a, an element of the Cartesian product of the domains of several variables. Okay, so as soon as you have few variables with few elements in the domain of each can, in the, of each variable, and then the Cartesian product becomes very big. Okay? And then, so it means that you have many candidates with a combinatorial structure for the candidates, like the dinner example that we said before, or like a car. When you choose a car, you have many different uh, elements that you want to choose, like the, the, the maker, the, the, the engine, the color, the shape, you know, and each one of them has many different possibilities, many different concretizations, okay? And so you, you have many, many different possible cars, and you have to find a way to compactly represent your preferences over the cards without having to list all the possible cards. Okay? Um, so uh, what people have done in this area to use knowledge representation um, uh, tools and techniques to be able to compactly represent these preferences. Otherwise, it would be too much space and time for each individual to express their preferences, and also too much space and time for the chair to put together these preferences and de define the collective decision. And uh, I would just uh, mention two examples of two ways of modeling preferences compactly. One is soft constraints and one is CPNets, and they are prototypical of two different ways of representing preferences. One is very good for representing quantitative preferences, when you have costs or penalties or to represent different levels of preference. And the other one is very useful for representing qualitative preferences, where you don't have cost involved, so it would be not natural to say this one is preferred because it costs less, for example, but you just have that this is preferred to the other one period, you know, without putting a quantity of preference. So the first one is, uh, uh, I'll just give you two examples. One uh, first is an example of soft constraint, uh, is a particular uh, kind of soft constraint which is called fuzzy constraints. And uh, basically, each uh, you have uh, several variables. Like in this case, you have these four variables. I give a graph representation because that's what people usually use to graphically represent this problem. So you have the meal, uh, what you eat, what you drink, um, what uh, lunch time, and swimming time. 
Okay? And then you have uh, uh, things that relate uh, some variables. So you have, um, well, first of all, you have the domain of each variable, two values here, either fish or meat, two values for the wine, white or red, two values for the lunch time, two values for the swimming time. Okay? So these are the variables and the domains. And then you have uh, something which relates these two, which is called the fuzzy constraint, which for every combination of values of these two variables, which give you, will give you a, an element between 0 and 1. And the, mo the closest one, the, it means that is more preferred. So this is the combination which is the most preferred. This is less, this is less, and this is even less. Okay? And the same here, another soft constraint. And for each combination of values of these two, you have uh, one or less. Okay? And actually, in this case, you see this is a very special case of fuzzy constraint, where I'm just using one and zeros. So the top element and the worst element. So I'm trying here to represent actually a constraint, not a preference. Something which says these three combinations are acceptable, this one is not acceptable. Okay? So now when you want to, uh, now what are the po candidates here? The candidates are all the possible assignment of values Oh, sorry, I think there is some Italian here. There are all the possible assignment of values to these four variables. And for each assignment of values to these four variables, these numbers written here will allow you to say uh, how preferred is this assignment of values to these variables. So, for example, in this decision, which is this particular assignment, this means meat, this means white, uh, to these four variables, the preference is given by combining the values that are selected by the constraints. So here, uh, meat and white wine, meat here, white wine here, it gives you a 0, 3. Um, uh, one and two uh, gives you a zero, so you combine these two. In the case of fuzzy constraints, the combination operator is the mean, so you get a zero. Uh, so this decision, this candidate, has preference zero in this quantitative way of representing preferences. And this other decision, this means fish, this means white, uh, these other issues, you do the same thing, you combine, uh, you get a one here and one here, the preference is one. So you see this decision is better than that one because it gets a preference value which is higher than that one. Okay? So a quantitative way of representing preferences. Uh, let's look at the second uh, way of modeling preferences, CP nets. So in this case, uh, you have, um, I'll give you a simpler example because otherwise the picture would be too big. So you have just a main course with two values, a wine, two values, and the fruit, two values, okay? So in this case, you don't have quantities to tell you which thing is preferred to which other, but you just have a preference ordering. So for example, for the main course, you say fish is better than meat. But you don't tell me how much fish is better than meat. You don't tell me any number like I did before. For fruit, I'll tell you peaches is better than strawberries, period. For wine, I tell you something more complicated because the preference of wine depends on the choice of this other variable. So I will give you a table that for every value of the main course, fish and meat, will give you a preference ordering over the wine. So if there is fish, I prefer white to red. If there is meat, I prefer red to white. Okay? So this is the, how a CP net would describe preferences in this context. And then, given these preferences, qualitative preferences, this will induce a preference ordering, this one in this case, over all possible assignment of values to these three variables into their domain. In this case, the top one, the most preferred one, will be this, but then you have the other ones. This arrow means less preferred, okay, and the transitive closure as well. So this is the worst one. This is the optimal uh, uh, candidate. But you see there is also a lot of incomparability here. These two are incomparable. These two are incomparable, these two are incomparable, for example, and so on. So it's not a linear order in general. Okay, okay so let's just uh, compare and say, well, why, why do I have to choose between one and the other one? After, after all, okay, I choose one way of representing preferences or the other, it would be the same, you know, whatever is more natural to me. But actually, even these two very simple ways of representing preferences are very different in terms of the properties, expressiveness, and the computational properties they have. So, for example, if you like, in terms of preference orderings, well, soft constraints allow you to represent every preference order that you may have in mind, total, partial, and while CP nets only represent some preference ordering, so they are a bit restrictive in terms of expressibility of preference ordering. Then, computationally, um, to find an optimal decision in CP nets, a cyclic actually, is 
a cyclic recipient nets. A cyclic just means that uh, this graph here of the dependencies does not have cycles. So in CP nets, uh, it's easy, computationally easy. So it's in P to find an optimal decision, while in soft constraints, in general, it's a computationally difficult problem. To compare two decisions, even two candidates, to understand which one is better than the other one, then it's uh, computationally difficult in CP nets and easy in soft constraints. Okay? Find the next best decision, check it. So you see that these are very different uh, computational properties. Okay? And all these are questions that you may want to ask the agents, uh, and the agents have to be able to answer this question in order to vote. Okay? Because uh, if you just use plurality, you just need to answer this question because the agent have to submit just the optimal decision. But if you start using Borda, Copeland, those that uh, require comparisons, that you also need to, uh, these other, uh, to answer this other question or even others. Okay? okay, so when you aggregate preferences over these combinatorial domains, uh, suppose now we, use, we decided which preference formalism you use, like CP nets, soft constraints, or somebody else, and now you need to aggregate preferences over combinatorial domains, then people have tried to understand how to make it easy computationally to aggregate these preferences. So, for example, you could say, okay, instead of voting over can full candidates, okay, let's uh, vote over each variable at a time, since candidates, after all, are just values given to several variables. So you say, let's vote on each variable separately, asking the uh, individuals to tell me what they prefer in terms of one variable only, not the full candidates. And then, uh, if you do like that, uh, and then you collect all these uh, votes together, and then you say which is the winning value for each variable, and this is, the, is going to be your winning candidate. But if you do that, uh, you can imagine that the winning candidate can be something which is very bad for many agents, because you are forgetting the correlation between the different variables. Okay? Uh, other approaches that many people have used are called sequential approaches. So it's say, choose an ordering over the variables and vote on each variable separately, but not in parallel, in sequence. Vote on the first variable and choose the winning, winning value for that variable, and then broadcast this value to all the agents, and then the agents will embed this information into their preferences, and now you can vote for the second variable, and so on. Okay? So in this case, the results are much better in terms of the satisfaction of the agents, and still, you know, it is more feasible than just voting on full candidates. Okay. Uh, as I said, you also have to deal with incomparability, but let's skip that, let's not go into that, and the uncertainty and vagueness in precise preferences. So you have to, in some way, to deal with the fact that some preferences are missing. So either you elicit preference, some of the missing preferences from the agents, asking them questions, or comparisons questions, for example, until you have enough preference data to be able to, to declare the winner. Huh? Or you do in some other way, or you learn some of these missing preferences some other way. So machine learning people have been working here on preference elicitation. The last thing that, uh, remember, was, no, one other thing that, remember, was very different between voting theory and multi-agent setting is this computational concern. So we want to have, uh, uh, to avoid spending too much time to elicit preferences and to compute the winners, but uh, at the same time, people have thought that computational uh, um, difficulties are good in some sense. Because you remember that we said that every voting rule is manipulable, but uh, it may take uh, uh, a long time to, for the manipulator to understand how to submit false preferences in order to get a better result. So to understand how to manipulate, for certain voting rules, it could be a very computationally difficult task. So computational barrier now, in this case, for the behavior that you don't want to have, is actually useful, okay? because you would like to use voting rules you cannot avoid manipulation, according to gibbert satterway theorem, but at least you would like to use voting rules where manipulation is a difficult, computationally difficult task. Uh, for example, here, okay, so, okay, so you can describe manipulability as a decision problem. So you say, I have, uh, um, I have uh, all the preferences except mine. Okay, I know all the preferences of everybody else. I am a voter, and then the question that I'm asking. Can I submit a, a, a fall, true or false preferences in such a way that I get a certain result for, uh, as a collective result? So this, this is the uh, decision problem, which uh, is then 
complexity, uh, computational complexity study to understand whether manipulation is difficult or not. And some examples is here. So if you use plurality and Borda, which are very natural to use, well, unfortunately, these are very nice, very natural. They have many desirable properties, but they are very easy to manipulate. Manipulability of these two is in P. STV instead, and this is a bit predictable because STV has this sequential nature, so it's difficult to understand what will come out if you submit full preferences, but this is just an intuition. But STV is uh, one of those rules which is incomplete to manipulate. So STV, it has some nice properties, but it also has the other nice property that is computationally difficult to manipulate. Okay, uh, okay so we that. Uh, so let's look uh, very briefly at these last two examples that I wanted to give you. Uh, one is sentiment analysis, which uh, expresses the fact that you have to deal with large set of voters, and the other one is table matches. So sentiment analysis usually does like that. It gives you the sentiment of a collectivity of people by looking at what individuals write in some text, blogs, tweets, uh, social networks in general. Okay? And what it does from the individual text, it extracts a, polar it extracts a polarity or a graded polarity. And it uh, can be positive, negative, or neutral. And then um, it asks a question about usually one item. Say, what do people think? What do the collectivity think about X? And then uh, it wants to understand whether the opinion of the collectivity is positive, or neutral, or negative about this one item. Okay? So, and the collective, collective opinion is that the percentage of positive individual opinions. Okay? But suppose you have this example. So you have 90 people voting like this. So this, this Technology means that 90 people say that they prefer A to B, and this uh, bar distinguishes positive opinions from negative opinions. So 90 people prefer A to B, but they have positive opinions about both. Okay? And 10 people prefer B to A, but B is on the positive side, and A is on the negative side. So uh, what the sentiment analysis in this basic uh, formulation would do, would say that B is the most preferred to, by the collectivity between A and B. Why? Because B, after all, has 100% of the people that has a positive, have a positive opinion about B. Because these guys have a positive opinion and also these other guys have a positive opinion. So in some sense, sentiment analysis in its basic formulation forgets the fact that here A and B not only are both on the positive side, but A is preferred to B. So there is polarity information here, but there is also preference information. So if you look at this same example from a preference, a pure preference aggregation point of view, which means that preference aggregation does not look at polarities, just looks at orderings, then in this case, most voting rules would declare A the winner. Because 90% of the people say that A is better than B, and only 10 people say that B is better than A. Okay? And of course, p uh, different results can come out of the different rules, but most of the people, most of the voting rules would say that uh, the winner is not B, but is A. Okay? So these uh, two results, B and A, come from two very extreme ways of looking at this information that you extracted from the text. Because sentiment analysis just looks at the polarity. What is on the positive side, what is on the negative side. While preference aggregation only looks at the ordering, forgets about polarity, only looks at who, what is better, what is worse in the individual preferences. So the idea here would be actually to consider both kinds of information. So to adapt the voting theory uh, and the sentiment analysis to merge them and to be able to reason with both polarity and preference ordering information. Uh, the challenge here is how to extract preference opinions from text, absolute opinions and comparisons, how to model the individual preferences, how to aggregate them into a collective opinion. As I said, I think the, uh, one of the ways is to consider both polarity and uh, uh, preference ordering, how to validate the aggregation method, and uh, the final is how to deal with big data. Because in this case, the number of voters, the number of agents, individuals expressing opinion is very big. Okay? The last example is table matching. So table matching has to do with match, uh, there, you have two sets of agents. For example, students and schools, you have to match students and schools, doctors and hospitals, sailors and ships, people looking for jobs and job offers. Okay? So you have two sets of agents. Each agent of one set ranks completely all the agents on the other set. It says which one he prefers. For example, here, every doctor will rank every, all the hospitals, and every hospital will rank all the doctors. And now you want to match doctor and hospital in such a way that uh, this pairing is the best that you can do according to the preferences of these both doctors and hospitals. Okay? 
It has many, many applications. It, it allows uh, these people, Rotter Shapley, to have the Nobel Prize in last year. And, um, and uh, it has this notion of stability. A stable matching it means that it's a matching where no pair in the matching is in danger of being broken because somebody is very unhappy. Okay? So instead of giving the example, I will just go. Uh, in general, given any matching problem, so two sets of agents, preferences of these people over the other people, preferences over the other ones, do you always have at least one stable marriage? And actually, you have many. And finding a stable matching is an easy task, is in P. In polynomial time, you can find a stable matching. Okay? There is a very famous Gale Shapley algorithm that finds a stable matching in a number of steps, which is most quadratic in the number of agents. Okay? Um, there are variants of stable matching which actually solving them is not in P, but is in NP. And this happens when you make stable matching a bit more realistic. So in this case, you assumed, as I told you, that everybody on this side ranks all the other people on the other side. Every doctor ranks all the hospitals, every hospital ranks all the doctors. This is very unrealistic. So sometimes people don't want to rank everybody. They just want to rank some and not even mention the ones that are not acceptable to him. Okay, so you have, uh, you have uh, truncated lists. And you can also have that when people rank the other people on the other side, you can also have that some, they rank some of them as equally preferred. So you may have ties. When you put together these two very uh, reasonable and realistic features, ties and incomplete preference list, then finding a stable matching is not more in P, but is a difficult, computationally difficult problem. Because now you don't have, uh, you may have many stable matchings, but they all have a diff may have different numbers of pairs and people that are left unmatched. Okay? And so what you want to find is a stable matching, which is the as largest cardinality, which is the num largest number of matchings and fewer numbers of people that remain unmatched. And this is NP-hard. Okay? So in these two problems, um, uh, there are many approaches that have been, and in particular in the second one, which is more difficult, uh, there are many different approaches that can be used uh, to solve especially this more difficult problem, a systematic search algorithm, uh, loc but local search algorithm that... Uh, maybe do not assure finding a stable matching, but most of the time they do, but they, they perform much better. And so the, uh, what is nice is there's a local search, very local search, very simple local search algorithm for problems until you minimize the number of, I mean, you, mean, you want to get, get stability, but also you minimize the number of people that are unmatched. And uh, then here, actually, I think the distribution and parallelization can help because uh, these uh, uh, local search algorithms are uh, very, uh, easy, easily distributable, and so it's nice to understand, to try to understand how to make them scale up even more, because some of these problems in practice are very big numbers, in order to get uh, them to scale up. Okay? Uh, this is a very short book if you want to know more about computational social choice, all these different aspects that I just briefly mentioned. And so the conclusions that I have are mostly questions, you know, for me and for you as well. So first one, as I said, the preference aggregation has always been considered a very a centralized process. People submit preferences, somebody puts them together and gives the result. So it would be nice to understand whether we can make it distributed to, for two reasons. First, because maybe preferences are really distributed and you don't want to centralize them, you don't want to share them. And second, because maybe by distributing that we can scale up better, okay? In this example, as I told you. Uh, the, the other one is that, um, if uh, preference aggregation techniques, uh, the ones that I told you and also other ones that are in the literature, can be useful in the setting that you are considering, in the distributed setting that you are considering. I didn't mention machine learning. I mentioned, but I didn't go into machine learning. But machine learning has also a role to play here because of these uh, missing preferences and preference solicitation. So it uh, presents, uh, uh, preference aggregation presents aspect of both optimization and machine learning, which uh, so covers, it should cover all the interest of all of you. And so it's uh, really, it would be nice for people like you to get into this, uh, interested into this setting, and try to see what can be done in order to make a big step forward together with the people in computational social choice for scaling and for handling more uh, uh, realistic setting. OK, so I think I'm now. Yes. Do 
What is the question? Well, what in the scenario? In the scenario, yeah. You're given, uh, all the yeah. And you're the yes. Ah, uh, you cannot detect it. I, I don't think it's easy or difficult. I mean, so you just get uh, the preferences, and you don't know which ones are false and which ones are uh, real. So, so you, 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 sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Only when? Is yeah. You're saying that is it is it possible only when? No, I don't think so. Of course, there is a question to understand. That how many times, uh, if you use these very extreme approaches, uh, you know, sentiment analysis, preference aggregation, it's a question to understand how many times you actually have these different uh, results uh, in general. But uh, I don't think it can happen only when you have manipulation. Uh, uh, well, in this example, I didn't say if it's strongly positive or strongly negative. I just said, um, in the Yes. People have, in terms of the missing uh, information, I mean, uh, you use a sample. But uh, people have used many different techniques from, uh, uh, you know, machine learning techniques uh, to fill the missing data or to predict what some of the missing data is uh, or to, and also other techniques to understand actually how much of the missing data you need in order to define the result. You know, because you don't want to feel the missing data more than what you need. Okay. But there are many, many different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, so one way of uh, uh, giving like incorrect references is that you want to manipulate the results. Yeah. Another way is a signal mechanism. Like you want to give preferences. Like you want to hide your biases or prejudices, but you want to signal something else because you don't, maybe your prejudices are, you, want, you don't want to feel embarrassed in front of your audiences about your biases. Okay. So people tend to use signals and they want to give something which they don't believe in but they would like to give that as a signal. Rate somebody over the other. So that is uh, uh, there's not and you, I think that uh, the reason to submit false preferences uh, could be many. This one is one uh, but um, if you submit false preferences and the result is that you gain, so you get a better result according to your preferences by submitting false preferences, then it is manipulation. Maybe you do it for one reason or for another one, but it is manipulation. Um, perhaps that can be detected. Perhaps that can be detected. Maybe, maybe some specific form of manipulation can be detected, yes, because they have specific structure.